Hey, you guys, and welcome to day four of the five day live stream. We are coming down to the close, uh, but today we've got a really great topic. The topic today is how I went from broke and bored to selling my hand goods to multiple boutiques in New York City in under two years. I'm really excited to dive into this topic today and tell you all about how I did it. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Mary and I'm the host of the Leather Tamers Facebook group. Also, I run the website leatherbeast.com where I teach you how to make and sell your leather goods. I teach you how to create a profitable leather goods business and one where you can maximize your sales. Um, so um, say hi. If you're joining, say hi in the comments. Tell us where you're from and tell me what your experience is with selling your leather work to stores. Have you ever done it? Have you tried to do it, been unsuccessful? Are you doing it now and it's going great? Hey, James. Um, I would love to know what your personal experience is with this, if any. Um, oh, and before we dive in, I just want to remind you um, to click the link in the description and get on the VIP list for lucrativeleathercraft.com um, and you will get these special links sent to you in an email tomorrow when the course opens. This link will give you $200 off of the price of enrollment. So that's a lot of savings. Um, make sure you're on that list if you're interested in that course. Um, so let's let's dive in. So, um, so let's rewind a little bit here. A couple years ago, actually 10 years ago, that was a long time ago. So 10 years ago, I found myself in a job that I really did not like um, and a job where I didn't feel comfortable with the people. I mean, let's just put it this way. I would, I would arrive at work like 30 minutes early and sit outside and in the park or something just so I can mentally prepare to go in and face my day. Um, I worked as a legal assistant. I was doing basic administrative stuff. This was when I was kind of in my early 20s. Um, and it was just one of those jobs where, let's just say the people didn't really have a lot of politeness and manners. Um, so that day they called me in and they said, and this was 2008, mind you, if you remember, so many people were getting laid off from jobs because the economy was kind of tanking, especially in New York City. My roommate had gotten laid off the week prior. All my friends were getting laid off from their stable jobs. And that day was my day that they called me in and they were really, you know, kind of shy about telling me and I could not help but contain my excitement. It was every taking everything I had in me to be like, oh my God, I'm so excited. This is finally happening. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so I got laid off. I went home and I was like, okay, now what? I mean, luckily I was in my early twenties. I didn't have any dependents. My expenses were really low. So I wasn't that worried about money at the time. I knew I could find another job or, you know, or do something else. At, at the very least, I could kind of ride out that unemployment for, you know, a couple weeks or months if I needed to, and that would kind of cover my base bills. So anyways, long story short, I started working um, just full time on some of my hobbies. I've always been a maker. I've always been interested in making things with my hands. A lot of textile related things like sewing, sewing clothes, sewing home accessories, knitting, crocheting, embroidery, anything, you know, that kind of has that sort of traditional um, history to it. I'm like totally into it. So I started um, making stuff. I started making little tops and dresses and just really simple stuff. And my friends were like, what, what are you doing? This is amazing. These clothes are awesome. Like I would totally buy these, like you should sell them. Um, so that is, that was my phase one to this whole little two year journey here is getting that initial validation. Hey, Bridget, getting that initial validation from friends and family. Now, it wasn't that I knew that I would be a complete success because I had validation from my friends and family because, you know, your friends and your family, they're always generally going to be supportive and be your biggest cheerleaders, you know, but since I had, I did have that positive feedback that I was getting from them, I knew that I was on the right track and there might be something here. So 
phase two was setting up shop and starting my um, online business. And I started with um, I started with an Etsy shop, and soon after that, I moved on to or I, in conjunction with that, started a Squarespace shop. Uh, or no, I started with Shopify first, actually. This is when Shopify was just coming out. And I had a friend help me set up the Shopify shop. So I had these two websites going. And I just was kind of like, you know, I'll just see, I'll see how it goes. The overhead is pretty, um, not very expensive at all. You know, maybe 30 bucks a month tops. Um, so, um, and at this point as well, you have to remember this is 2008, 2009, social media was kind of just starting to get traction. It had been around for a little bit at that point, but it wasn't nearly what it is now and nearly as powerful as it is now. Um, so I really had to hustle to market my products and try and find those customers and find other ways for getting in front of them. It was, it was a pretty big struggle, but I started figuring it out. I started figuring out how to get in front of customers and how to market and message my products, how to kind of put them in the best light and share them with my customers. I also realized that I can't just sit back and wait for my customers to come to me. I had to learn that the hard way. Um, you actually have to get out there and pound the pavement and really put a lot of time and effort into your marketing strategy if you want it to work. So once I did that, I started getting sales, which was super exciting because here I am, I just got laid off. My parents are like, oh, I'm worried. What are you gonna do? You're gonna have to move back home. And I'm like, I am not moving back home. <laughs> this will work. Um, and, I, and I'm, you know, I had just kind of on a whim started my own business and, um, and it was really exciting. So um, phase three, real quick, before we get into phase three, I know there's some people who have just joined us here. Make sure you click that link in the description if you want to save $200 off of enrollment. You'll get on the VIP list by signing up there and I'll make sure I send you that link tomorrow when the car opens for my course. Anyways, phase three. After I had had some success online, I was like, you know what? I need to try one of these um, one of these craft fair markets. And so um, one of the first ones that I did was a market called Renegade Craft Fair, which if you're in the New York area or if you live in any major city throughout the U.S., you've probably heard of it. Even if you don't live in a major city, it's one of the biggest craft fairs. It has grown into being one of the biggest craft fairs um in the country and they're in 12 different cities and they have multiple fairs each year so um i did it when it came to brooklyn the first year i was like this sounds awesome i want in and i gotta be honest i was super nervous to do it for a couple of reasons number one the upfront investment was a lot it was i think it was something like 300 dollars for a table which doesn't seem like that much now, but back then when I had never done a craft show before, I had no idea if I was going to sell one thing or 20, you know, like I just didn't know if I was going to make any sort of profit on that. But I was like, you know what, this is a great opportunity for me to not only try and sell some of my leather goods, some of my samples, to, you know, I always had a big giant sale rack just to kind of clear out some inventory, um, but also to speak with my customers in person and just market my business generally, even to the non-buyers. So um, fast forward, that market went great. I made triple, quadruple my money back. So I was really happy with that. I met a lot of people. Um, I handed out business cards to everyone that even paused at my table. That was like one of the biggest ways that I was kind of marketing my business at that craft fair, even if people weren't buying, I was still talking to them, being friendly, because you never know um, what your conversations are gonna lead to, whether that person just looks you up later or they say, oh, that friendly girl, that friendly guy at that craft fair, he might like my friend and maybe they could work together. You just never know. So I knew that much going in, that I had to just stay really positive and be um, just really, 
work it at the craft fair, which is a, was a little tough for me because I'm not necessarily naturally um, extroverted. I can really turn it on and, you know, be personable and bring out my personality. But for the most part, I'm a little bit more comfortable behind the scenes. Um, but that being said, um, it, you also the vendors that you meet at the markets, it's an excellent way to kind of um, network with other vendors. You never know when you're going to want some inside information about another market and you might find someone who's done it before and they can give you um, sort of a lowdown on that or, um, or just favors if you need someone to watch your table or you need to make change. So I'm always kind of like talking to the people on the right and the left side of me and also always making a round around the, uh, the fair to talk to other vendors and, and see who I could potentially collaborate with and cast a wire net. So those are just some of the ways that I used the in-person markets to, um, to just further network my, my brand and my business. And that dovetails nicely into phase four, which was getting into getting the wholesale consignment accounts at multiple boutiques in New York City. So um, at, the, at one of those markets that year, I, uh, I had a woman come by my table. She really liked my stuff. She didn't buy anything, but she said she really liked it and she, that she had a friend who had a store in the city and that I should talk to her and that she would, you know, her friend would probably really like my stuff for her store. And I was like, amazing. That's great. Like I just hadn't even like considered it at that point. Before you know it, I'm in the store owner's offices showing her my samples. She places an order and continues to place orders. You know, she placed that first order right on the spot. I was elated and kind of like, wow, I just, I did, really didn't think that that could happen. But if you have a really good product, if you're someone who is easy to work with, if you're organized, if you're flexible, that's, you know, that's half the half the piece of the puzzle. So, um, so that is how I got my first wholesale account. And then from there, I, I had the confidence then after I got that first account, I had the confidence then to reach out to other stores and really perfect my pitch and to get other um, accounts, both wholesale and consignment. Because a lot of times when you pitch to a store, they might like your stuff, but they're not sure that you're a new vendor and they don't want to be stuck with the inventory. So they want, um, a lot of them would be um, interested in doing consignment where they don't have to pay for anything. They just put your um, products in their shop. If it sells, then that's when they pay you your your half. And then usually after you do consignment for a little while, they will start to place orders because they know that there's a demand for your product. So that's the quick definition between wholesale and consignment. Um, and um, yeah, and so before that year was up, I had my products in four different boutiques in New York City, which was really exciting, um, profitable. Um, it was just a great experience how all of that unfolded and sort of one opportunity led into the next. So, um, so when I, when I started selling my leather goods, as you've probably already guessed, there was no, there was no roadmap. Sorry, my, my handmade goods. There was no roadmap. Nobody was telling me how to do it. Nobody was telling me how to use social media. Social media didn't really, as a business tool wasn't huge then. Um, and I really had to figure those things out. And actually there's not even a really a great, um, a great resource right now for people, for leather workers, um, telling them exactly how they can start their leather business um, until now with lucrative leather craft. And that's my course. So if you're interested in um, starting a leather goods business and you kind of just want some step-by-step -step guidance, um, I'd encourage you to click that link above at least get on the list so that you have the link if you want to check it out. And, um, and yeah, cart opens tomorrow. So I'm super excited to get a new group of students and just help you guys just really create an amazing business and really accomplish your business goals, whatever they are. If you want to start just a small business on the side, or you want to like hit it out of the park and create a full-time 
full-fledged business. I want to be there helping you, supporting you, and being your cheerleader along the way because I think it's really exciting to be able to create something um, that you have full control over. You have control over how much income you want to make. You know, if you want to not make so much income, then don't hustle too much. If you want to make a lot of income, then you're going to go out there and hustle. So, um, so yeah, that is it. And then tomorrow, tomorrow's day five, the last day of the series, and I'm doing something a little bit different. So I hope you'll join. Um, it's more of a masterclass. It's more of a formal slideshow presentation that I've prepared, um, and we're going to go through some of the uh, the key areas that I think are sort of the backbone of creating a really um, efficient and strategic. Um, business where you're selling physical goods to your ideal customer. Um, let me just see if I missed anything. Oh yeah, and we'll cover things like standing out from the competition, you know, planning an effective promotional strategy, serving your customer, those sorts of things. So um, please at least join me for that. It's free. You don't have to register. Just show up here. The only thing is you're not going to see my face. It's just going to go right into the slide deck. So if you see that, that's me. I'll be talking over the slides and walking you through it. Um, I'll be doing that at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time right here on the Facebook page. So I will uh, see you there. Thank you so much for joining. Oh, I just see a couple questions. Um, hi, Bridget. Did you make it yourself and kept doing that when you got bigger orders. Yes, I was always sort of a one-woman show. Um, my orders honestly never got massive. It wasn't like people were ordering hundreds of pieces. It was more like five to ten pieces at a time and then they would reorder like that, which was just enough to keep me really busy and, um, and still be able to do it myself. I wasn't quite interested in, you know, kind of farming it out to a factory or to anything at that point. I still wanted to keep everything under one roof and have me solely making everything. I went and invested in some big industrial sized sewing machines uh, to the disappointment of my roommate who wasn't super happy about that taking up space in the living room. But hey, you know, that's, that's living in New York City for you, a small space. Um, Uh, okay, if anybody else has any questions, drop them in the comments and I'll type back a response later on. But I'll see you here tomorrow at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time for that masterclass. Thanks, guys. I'll see you later.